The portion of God's word that we'll focus on this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3. Let's begin with prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I wanted to share with all of you this year and, and have you receive the Shriner family Christmas card. But since I'm a frugal guy and I wanted to save on the postage, I figured instead of sending it to all of you individually, I'd just share it with you up here on the screen today. So we got a nice picture at Thanksgiving time to put on the front of the card with a nice Merry Christmas message. But this year we really wanted to also add a, a passage from Scripture that could capture the essence of, of true Christmas joy. And so we did some searching in our Bibles, looking for just the right passage, and, and I think we really nailed it this year. So on the back side, you can see the passage that we chose. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Mm. That's some pure Christmas joy right there, isn't it? Okay, I got to be honest with you, this isn't actually our Christmas card. We have a baby due in a month. We have no time to send Christmas cards this year. <laughs> but if we did, if we did, would that be a message that would fill your heart with Christmas joy? I'm guessing probably not. And maybe that's why it's a little bit interesting. Maybe it seems a little bit strange for us that, that those words that I just read are contained in our gospel reading, the selected gospel reading for this weekend which, as Pastor Wardell said, is called Gaudete, or Rejoice Sunday. It's interesting that in a, in a Rejoice Sunday service, the message from John the Baptist here seems to be devoid of joy. Or at least, it might seem that way. And so if hearing that message from John today has you wondering to yourself, John the Baptist, preacher of joy? Then together today, let's dig deeper into John's message. And we'll see that John is indeed a preacher of beautiful, comforting joy. Beautiful, comforting joy that can help us to prepare our hearts for our Savior's coming. Now, I think most people probably think of John for his camel's hair wardrobe and his diet of locusts and wild honey. But most importantly, John the Baptist was God's chosen messenger. The one God had selected before he was even born to go to the people, to baptize them, and to preach a message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. God called John specifically to be the one who would prepare the people's hearts for the coming of the Savior. And that had been prophesied centuries before. As we heard last week, and the prophet Malachi foretold, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. And as Isaiah prophesied, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. And so John carries out this calling that God had given to him, and the crowds came out to him to hear his message and to be baptized by him. And yet as they come, they aren't greeted with this warm, joyful welcome like they might have expected. Instead, John addresses these crowds coming out to him, you brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the coming wrath? Now John isn't just addressing the Pharisees and the other self-righteous religious leaders with this cutting nickname. Actually, it tells us in the text that, that John addresses every single person in the crowd this way. Calling every single last one of them the, the brood or the children of vipers. Now, as a desert dweller himself, John would have known about vipers. Vipers are not the biggest snakes, but they're some of the most deceptive snakes. Oftentimes, a viper just sort of looks like a stick on the ground until it strikes. And then that which seems to be rather harmless shows itself for what it truly is, one of the deadliest poisonous snakes. And in that, it's pretty fitting that John would refer to these people as the offspring of, of vipers because every single one of them had been filled with a deadly kind of poison. 
a venom that had been put there by their forefathers and their religious leaders and by the serpent himself, Satan. And that's why John begins his message this way, with a stern warning. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. See, the deadly venom that had been pumped into these people was the, the deceptive belief that they were saved because they could trace their bloodline back to Father Abraham. And because they, they went through the motions and carried out all of these outward rituals. See, that was a deadly venom that had been put inside of them. Because they believed that because they were Israelites, they were part of God's chosen people, and because they, they regularly just sort of went through the motions, that means that they could really just live however they wanted without any sort of consequence. See, for them, Father Abraham was sort of a, a get-into-heaven-free card. And because the crowds really had no idea how deadly this deceptive belief was, John couldn't be a preacher of joy. At least, not yet. And that's why John gives these people a, a heavy dose of the law as a reality check about the tenuous nature of their spiritual condition. He tells them, The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. See, because these people didn't think they had anything to repent of, they weren't producing fruits of repentance. And that was leaving them ripe for judgment. But God also had a broader audience in mind for John's message than just the Pharisees and the Israelites. It's a message that, that you and I need to hear too. Now, I'm assuming that a good majority of us here are not banking on our Israelite heritage as the source of our salvation. But are there other bloodlines that you've been putting your trust in? Other bloodlines that you've been depending on for your salvation? If your statement, your thought that I'm a Lutheran, if that satisfies your conscience as you go about living like a heathen, then that means that the serpent has struck with his venom. See, if these like these crowds, if we put our, our hope, if we put our trust for salvation in these outward things, some external identity that we possess or outward actions that we perform, then God's grace very easily becomes a license for us to just start living for ourselves. So, I'm a Lutheran. Or, if that FVL letter jacket that you wear around leads you to feel like that means you can live according to the standards the world has for teenagers and not God ex God's expectations, then the serpent has struck with his venom. If I send my kids to Mount Olive School or I send them to the Sunday school, leads you to believe that you're now off the hook for the spiritual care of their lives, then the serpent has struck. If sitting in these pews or volunteering your hours or dropping your money in the offering plate, or preaching the sermon leads you to believe that you are now excused to walk back out those doors today and just pick up your sins right where you left off, then the serpent has struck with his venom. You see, we struggle with something that's called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance, if you've never heard of it, is the thought that although we understand and acknowledge that we do things that are bad and wrong, in order to alleviate our psychological guilt, we're very good at convincing ourselves and coming up with all sorts of rationalizations and excuses and reasons why the things that we do really aren't bad. I think pretty much every single one of us could teach a master's course on the art of excusing the sins that we commit, right? And the reality is, if we rely on those things, those bloodlines in our lives, then Satan's poison is creeping deeper into our veins and going to our hearts to kill us. And that's why we need to hear the message of John the Baptist ringing in our ears. The axe is at the root of the trees, ready to cut down all the fruitless trees and throw them into the fire. A preacher of joy... No, at least not yet. 
because John realized that these people needed to first understand that they were poisoned before he could give them the antidote. Now God be praised that some of the people in the crowds were cut to the heart by God's law. They came to an understanding of their sin and their failure. They understood their need for forgiveness and they confessed their sins before God, pleading with John the Baptist, well, what should we do then? And that's when the heart of the joyful message of John the Baptist comes to the forefront. As John takes these broken sinners and he leads them down into the waters of the Jordan River and administers to them a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I don't want you to lose sight of the beauty of this picture. At the Jordan River, the same Jordan River that the Israelites had to cross over in order to reach the Promised Land. After all of the years of slavery in Egypt, after all the years that they had been wandering in the wilderness, they crossed the Jordan to reach the Promised Land. And at the same Jordan River, God takes these people who for so many years had been wandering in the, in the wilderness of self-righteousness and Satan's deception, who had been caught in slavery and sin. And in the Jordan, God gives these people a new life, granting to them the forgiveness of their sins through faith in the Savior that was to come, the Savior that John was preparing their hearts to meet. See, that same thing happened for you through the waters of your baptism where God transformed you from a child of the serpent into a child of God. And so having a new life, having the forgiveness of sins, the people then look to, to see what they can do. What comes next? Note, John calls this a, a baptism of repentance. Now that word repentance, it has some confusion attached to it at times. Many people think that repentance has to do with our emotions. If you're really sad and you feel really bad and you beat yourself up over your sins, then that obviously means that you're repentant of them. And certainly a person who is truly repentant of their sin is going to feel sorrow and guilt over their sin against God. But I can tell you I have a nearly three-year-old daughter who is basically an expert at, at turning on the waterworks when she gets in trouble for doing something bad, only to turn right around again with a smile on her face and do that same sinful thing again after the discipline has come to an end. And I also have a 30-year-old heart beating in my chest that's very adept at doing the exact same thing. You see, true repentance isn't as much about our emotions as it is about motion. The repentance literally is a, a turning. Repentance means that we have our hearts and our minds changed about sin. We look at sin in a completely different way. You see, by nature, our hearts view sin as something joyful, something that we should pursue. But through repentance, we see sin for the, the poisonous, deadly venom that it is. To go from seeing sin as something, from something desirable to something repulsive. In the same way that you'd change your mind about chugging that glass of water on a hot summer's day when you realize that the glass is full of salt water. Repentance requires a turning. But if our hearts are naturally seeing sin as something joyful to pursue, then, then how do we have the change of heart that we need? It can only happen through God's powerful word. We need God to be the one that does the changing, that does that turning. And that's why John's message at first sounded so joyless. Because John realized that these people needed to be cut with the law before they could be healed with the gospel. It's kind of like the way that your muscles grow. Did you know that your muscles have to be broken down in order to grow? When you exercise, when you lift weights, things like that, you are doing damage to your muscle fibers. And then your body goes to work repairing that damage and making new muscle fibers that are bigger and stronger and thicker. In order to build up, you literally have to be 
broken down. And repentance works in the same way. We need God to come and break down our sinful, self-righteous hearts and change us and turn us away from our sin. But then comes the other part of repentance. The beautiful part is that as you turn, you need something or someone to turn to. A solution for your sin. And that's where we see John begin to carry out the work that God had called him to do. As he tells the crowd the good news of where they should turn. He says, One more powerful than I will come the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. See, John prepares the people's hearts by pointing them to Jesus, by telling them about the Savior who was to come, the Savior that he would later point to and say, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John preaches the, the good news of the gospel to drive into these people's hearts the good news that they weren't going to be saved by their bloodline that connected them to Abraham, but through the innocent blood of their Savior that would be shed on the cross. You see, repentance is about turning, but it's also about trusting. Trusting that the Savior did indeed come to take away every single last one of your sins. To trust that God kept his promise that he made to Adam and Eve when he sent his son, born in Bethlehem, to grow up and crush the serpent's head and drain every last drop of the venom of sin from your heart. And that good news of Jesus, it produces joy in our lives. The gospel leads to buds of joy. And as our faith continues to grow through God's powerful word, those buds of joy, they blossom into fruits of repentance. Actions that we perform because of God's grace. Not to earn God's grace, but because of God's grace. Because of his grace and his majesty and his glory. Things that we do, not to placate God, not done grudgingly because we have to please God so he'll keep blessing us, but literally tapping into the joy that we have through our unity with Christ and using the gifts he's given to us to give him glory and to show our faith. What do those fruits look like in your life? John gives us some examples of the, the people he talked to. See, John encourages the, the crowds that came out to see him. The man with two tunics should share with him who has none. And the one who has food should do the same. And to some tax collectors, John encouraged, don't collect more than you're required to. And to some soldiers, he encouraged, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Notice the, the fruits of repentance that John describes for these people. They're not huge, life-changing, sweeping changes, are they? He doesn't tell these crowds that they need to sell all of their possessions and move out into the wilderness or into a monastery. He simply tells them, out of your abundance, joyfully share and take care of those who are in need. He doesn't tell these tax collectors and these soldiers that they need to quit their professions and join him as preachers out in the wilderness. He simply tells them, joyfully carry out your profession with faithfulness and honesty. Do these things out of joy for the grace that you have received from God. And really, our fruits aren't going to look any different. Our fruits of repentance out of joy for the forgiveness that we've won and that Christ won for us in baptism and on the cross. It's going to look like things like us using the gifts that God has given to us to joyfully give him praise and glory. It's going to look like joyfully and faithfully carrying out the different vocations that God has given to you in your life. It's going to look like joyfully using the things that God has given to you to, to show love and care for the people around you. And how can we do that? Because as we heard in the reading from Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, if we're being honest, we're not always going to do that perfectly, are we? There are going to be days when your tree looks more sparse than it does full of fruit. 
And the warning for us is that at times like that, Satan is going to strike. He's going to strike with his venom of apathy or his venom of overwhelming guilt to try and get you to fall away. But it's at times like that that we need to cling that much tighter to the Savior who was to come, the Savior who did come and crush the serpent's head, C- to cling to the, the perfectly fruitful tree that was cut down so fruitless trees like us might be saved and so that we might produce fruit. In our failures, we repent. We turn from our sin and we turn to the one that John told those people about at the Jordan, the one who was to come, the Savior of the world. Rejoice in that one who is coming and who says that when he comes, he's coming to gather his wheat into his barn. Rejoice, for the Lord is near. I will say it again. Rejoice. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which goes beyond all human understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue.